Hi, I'm Danilo, I'm part of the Evangelist team in AWS, and one thing that I'm passionate about is serverless. And I'm very happy today because I'm joined by two pillars of the serverless community. Can you please introduce yourself? Yes, uh, thanks for having me. My name is Matt. I'm an engineering manager at Lyft, and my history with serverless is, uh, revolves around Serverless Days uh, Seattle, hosting the Seattle Serverless uh, Meetup, and also working on one of the early Go frameworks for uh, Lambda called Sparta. I'm Austin, CEO and founder of a company called Serverless Inc. Uh, you can find us at serverless.com. My history with serverless is I created a very popular, probably one of the leading uh, development tools for building and operating serverless applications. It's called the Serverless Framework. Okay, so when did you start with serverless? I started with serverless as an engineering manager at Adobe when I noticed how much uh, time it took our team to get things to production. Uh, we had built a relatively complex sort of Docker I, CI, CD, uh, pipeline to get services out, and that was a lot of work that I, I didn't really think our team really needed to take to tackle, uh, and that was right about the time Lambda came out, and so Lambda sparked my interest because it was an opportunity as an engineering manager to reduce some of that toil for my team and get them focused on serverless, uh, and that, uh, when I stepped away from that role, was the impetus for working further in the community and helping to, to, to work on Sparta and get Go support. What year was that? Uh, 2015. Uh, yeah, we were very early and uh, in retrospect, had Lambda been around at the time we had done a lot of our work, we would have used it out of the box. So cool. Yeah. And you, Austin, uh, how did you start with serverless? I think my journey with serverless started when I was 15 and I first started programming. <laughs> and I realized that I love building stuff, but I didn't like maintaining those things later as much, right? So ever since then, I was just uh, been looking for that technology that allows me to build and build more without having to maintain it as much, right? And so when uh, Lambda came out in uh, 2014, uh, I thought to myself, this is it. This is everything I've always been looking for. I could build software that is almost like a set it and forget it architecture. And uh, I started building, I was working as an AWS consultant, and I started building projects for my clients, trying to fit all types of use cases and applications on top of Lambda. And it was a bit awkward at first, but um, uh, I realized the promised land. I was able to deliver that early on. And ever since then, I've been out telling everybody about uh, uh, building entire applications and all types of use cases on top of AWS Lambda in order to help deliver software that just has really low overhead. Uh, and it turns out a lot of people are interested in that. I remember we had this dinner at reInvent in 2015, I think it was when you were starting building the, the idea of what you were going to build and the company that you started. In retrospect, it seems very much that this whole serverless trend is not something different from the cloud. It's just an important chapter in the evolution of the cloud. As it evolves and as this abstraction over hardware and infrastructure, it gets simpler and simpler to use. Um, and so looking at it now, it's the most exciting space to be in because we're literally you know, at the front lines of what the cloud is becoming and transforming into. Um, and what I really like about it is that just going back to when I first got started, you know, these new serverless next generation cloud services, to me represent the greatest building blocks of all time. So you both built uh, frameworks not to help developers work with uh, serverless. So can you now share with me that how did the idea of building this kind of framework came and how did you start? Um, I think to echo on Austin's point, it was really, um, I wanted to build from the cloud down to our application, not from our application to the cloud. And so I wanted to approach it from, we had developed a set of microservices. Our team had come from statically compiled languages, whether that was C++ or Java. Go seemed to be gaining a lot of momentum at that time. And really it was if I took the user persona of a developer or a two piece of team that was capable of composing these very powerful cloud services, as well as natively supporting all the non-functional requirements such as KMS, observability, those kinds of things, what would that look like? And that's where I started. Um, and for most of our developers, they would start from a repo, start laying out a microservice, and I wanted that to kind of act as its own logical unit uh, in much the same way as we would have deployed a Sinatra app or an Express app. Um, and so to that extent, I wanted to make the developer experience similar to what we have, but the operational experience much different and much more powerful than something we had had in the past. And so that was the, the origin, and really it was how could I at that time, perhaps bend Lambda to support Go as it wasn't natively <laughs> supported, but thankfully it is now. Uh, and they're very happy with that journey to see sort of where it is today. That's so cool. Right? So you really like the Go language. I do. And what, what is the reason you like it so much? Um, 
Uh, I believe the best the best characterization of that is that it is asymptotically boring. Um, it is extremely focused on readability and legibility, which for a team that's working on a microservice that may have a several year journey, being able to have common code across a microservice that everyone, when they see it, follows idiomatic patterns, makes it easier for that to be shepherded as, as the business demands change and that code needs to evolve. It's not a, a learning curve. Um, I've worked with many languages over the years um, and their ability to be expressive uh, comes at a cost of their requirements and kind of cognitive demands of people jumping between a lot of different things. And Go is very straightforward. Uh, there's a few very hard things that it tackles directly, such as concurrency. Um, and for teams that are coming from statically compiled languages, uh, static linking types and a lot of kind of second order concerns about static validation and um, code linting and opinionated formatting kind of reduce a lot of that bike shedding conversation that can happen on development teams. So for me as both a practitioner and as someone who is a leader of teams, having that sort of consistent, co coherent um, representation of what we're trying to do is very important. Can you, Austin? So you already told us how mm. this idea was in your mind for lots of years now, making things simpler. How did you start, actually, the build-up of the serverless framework? Well, I think Matt and I could both probably agree that the world doesn't really need another framework, right? I, yes, <laughs> yes, we're much common ground there. Yes. <laughs> However, uh, with serverless architectures, if you're going to build stuff on this, these new next-generation gen auto-scaling, paper-execution cloud services, uh, again, there's a powerful value proposition there. That is, deliver software with radically low overhead, right? These new services are driving the cost of software down in every way. But the challenge is, it's a new way of building software. Uh, it's different from before. Uh, and you have to rethink how you do development. You can't really emulate these very well locally. Um, you have to rethink how you deploy, how all these services then work together. I mean, it's a very cool thing that we're unbundling the traditional app server and outsourcing all those pieces to these um, you know, super efficient cloud services. But then when you give all those pieces to a developer and organization, they have to then figure out, they have to learn about all the different services and try and glue them back together to form an outcome, which is what they really want to do at the end of the day. So that seemed like the perfect opportunity for a framework, a framework that could really focus more on outcomes, you know, not as much the underlying infrastructure to say, hey, what do you want to do? Do you want to make a REST API? Do you want to do a data processing pipeline? We're going to give you very simple syntax for describing that. And the framework will go provision all these new serverless cloud services and wire them up so they work together. And the developer has that outcome. They can achieve you know, that REST API, whatever it is, within a few seconds. Um, and I think that really helped a lot of developers adopt serverless uh, and the whole architecture. Yeah, I think that it gives also this familiar way of uh, building stuff that it's different from going to the console, configuring the, uh, configuring properties. So you can really have uh, one of the key features of the serverless framework is this configuration file where you have all your resources uh, and how they are linked to the business logic. Yes. And we try and keep it as simple as possible. Yeah. Because uh, I think developers especially are just trying to get stuff done and focus on the outcome, you know, and especially in their organization too, right? Yeah. You know, organization sets their quarterly goal to get a, deliver a database, <laughs> right? <laughs> They're trying to get product to the market as fast as possible. And the framework really helps you focus on that level, which I think is a lot of what serverless is about in general. And for people starting with serverless, now maybe uh, talking about a real use case where you worked on uh, where serverless gave some of these advantages can maybe help them understand how, how to start with the right foot. No? So can you maybe share some stories of something that you worked on? Yeah, I think uh, one thing I've heard mentioned in, in other presentations is DevOps is sort of the onboarding ramp for serverless and a good use case we had in that was we needed very lightweight edge authentication for an S3 download. Um, and worked with the operations person and said, well, what's, what are some ways we could do this? And we started talking about what is the operational load of doing that? Well, it should be in CloudFormation, there should be an ASG, there should be multiple EC2s, we're gonna run a, TC, a T2 micro, then we need Nginx, and it's just sort of this litany of things, right? And then once we have that provision, we need to track Nginx CVEs and things like that. And I said, well, you know what we could do is we could just use Lambda at Edge. Uh, and literally within a few hours, we had a Lambda at Edge provisioned that satisfied most of these requirements and helped us get to market extremely quickly. And it was something that we could sort of bridge the gap between the traditional gap between developers and um, operators. Uh, and so that was a very concrete use case and that grew into more 
operational focused things, um, say cron jobs, uh, and knowing that your cron job will reliably execute, uh, that's always a perennial problem. Can you maybe just explain what Lambda at the Edge is? Yes, so Lambda at the Edge is a lightweight, uh, point of presence, cloud front hosted version of the Lambda runtime that supports Java and Python. So if you have sort of very lightweight compute you need to do at the edge, you can do a little bit more now than you, you could originally. Um, it allows you to have Lambda functions that maybe rewrite HTTP requests, um, validate them against your database, and go to give you a little bit, of, um, little bit of functionality at the edge for improved customer experience, reduced latency, uh, with a very low cost way of onboarding that. Um, yeah, yeah. And so that, for particular, our particular use case, is very powerful. Yeah, I think now moving some of the intelligence at the edge is one of the key patterns also that I've seen. With yeah, putting customers. more compute on the edge is, is great <laughs> for um, customer experience. Uh, and resiliency and a lot of other reasons. Yeah, that's a great question. Actually, I think I would just like to talk about the adoption path that I see users have ah. every single day, you know, with our tooling with AWS Lambda. And that is specifically a single developer brings the knowledge of Lambda or the serverless framework into their organization. And they start looking around at simple DevOps tasks, like one little thing that they want to automate away. And the great thing about the serverless stuff is that you don't have to think about migrating a big app or building out this huge application. You just have to think about one task, you know, one unit of work, right? Just put that in a function, deploy it, set it and forget it, you know, and kind of walk away. And that's usually kind of what happens. So that single developer brings it into the organization, they deploy something, right? To some little DevOps task, cron job that runs reliably for yeah. the first time, you know. And, uh, and then they get some, you know, then their friends come over and they say like, hey, their colleagues, like, hey, this, that's pretty cool. You know, you, you made that. Let's put some more stuff in a few functions, right? And then um, soon they have about 10, 20 functions going. And then some, uh, some director, some decision maker looks at that and says, hey, let's build out a full application. And they start moving into usually REST APIs, microservices, um, kind of internal microservices is a big use case. And that captures a lot of attention. And all of a sudden, I'd say, within about six months to 12 months, we have small developer teams of maybe three to four developers that have provisioned over 100 functions, wow. right? And they're all kind of, you know, these DevOps tasks, auto, uh, simple pieces of automations, and then uh, internal microservices. Um, fast forward to some organizations uh, that use Lambda and use our tools. Uh, a couple years later, they have thousands of functions. <laughs> thousands, and they're using that for everything. They're doing uh, customer-facing APIs, um, you know, uh, big data processing pipelines, they're doing Lambda at Edge, they're doing uh, step functions workflows. Um, and that's one of the cool things to me. It's uh, even a couple years still, it's so early in the serverless trend, but after a couple years, teams, they're usually about like, maybe 20 developers then doing the serverless stuff. They've provisioned thousands of functions. And to me, that's mind blowing because can you just imagine what it's going to look like a few years from now, especially as everything kind of continues to mature and serverless goes increasingly mainstream? I think organizations and people who leverage this technology are going to be able to reach levels of productivity that we may not be ready for. You know, where organizations are provisioning just a ton of business logic, you know, automating every single possible thing that could ever happen. Um, and I don't know what that looks like yet, but I'm excited to get there because it just feels like superpowers at the end of the day. I, I agree with that. I think starting from where you are, starting from known pain points and building on those successes to build ever larger, more powerful um, systems is the way of the future. I think um, framing it from building the cloud down, if you imagine what would I need a two pizza team in order to have an API gateway, have a microservice, have a streaming system, be able to run ML, be able to do sentiment analysis, be able to get information, constructive information out of my analytics. It's a very, that's a very large project, but it's something a two pizza team can do by composing hosted services like recognition, like Kinesis. Um, and you can build incredibly powerful, uh, operationally sustainable services if you sort of uh, start serverless first and think about how to compose those services to build these extremely uh, impactful business deliverables. Yeah. So what do you think change in a team dynamics when you start adopting serverless? I think there's a bit of a learning curve. Um, and I think when teams become more comfortable using hosted services as their primitives, where we might in the past have looked at FFmpeg as a primitive to build on, now we might look at transcoding as a primitive to build on, which has a lot, of more, a lot more operational sophistication. The scope of what a team can build will grow and 
the impact that will have on the business will be substantial. Um, teams are no longer gated by their ability to deliver their own functionality, but more to creatively compose the many hosted services that are available. So I think it will mean organizations that embrace a generative culture, a trusting culture, a lean mindset, are positioned for amazing success because there is incredible power in the cloud that they can leverage if they if they sort of create the right environment for their team to flourish. Would you like to give like maybe a suggestion to a company starting now with serverless? Uh, how should they start maybe in adopting serverless <laughs> and in changing the way they build applications? Start small. Start Again, small. The, one of the great things about serverless is you, it's not big organizational effort or anything. It doesn't require that. It just requires putting a single thing in a Lambda so function. So find the right use case to, to get the experience and, uh, and iterate on top of that. Do it, deploy it within a few seconds, put it <laughs> out there, and you'll be hooked, right? You'll say like, oh, this is you know very low total cost of ownership. Why don't we do more like this? And then fast forward a few years later, we hear organizations saying things like serverless first. Right, everything, we want to do everything in a serverless pattern and only if it can't work with the, within the limitations of the serverless architecture do they fall back to other technologies. Yeah. But I also think, um, you know, totally agree with what uh, Matt said about um, these teams kind of moving with more autonomy um, yeah. to make a bigger impact. And I think that's something that uh, is, is something we see every day with teams doing serverless stuff and that yeah. is developers, uh, starting to be more product-minded, really think about the whole customer journey, um, owning all the things that they're deploying, um, and being incredibly productive. Um, and I think the organizations that really create that environment uh, will be able to move incredibly fast. Autonomy is really a key feature, I think, for software development, because otherwise you waste so much time waiting for something to happen. Autonomy and accountability. If you pair them yeah. and you create an environment where teams have are empowered to make decisions and learn and share, you can create an extremely high-performant culture, uh, which will, you know, ultimately, at the end of the day, moves your business forward.